I don't like to beat around the bush. I think it starts with a not delusional executive team, right? If your executive team goes to CES and they see floating tractors and they come back to you and say, hey, I really love floating tractors. And you're like, that's cool, Richard, but we have a green screen that's 30 years old. So I love floating tractors too. That's not something we have in, in our infrastructure. So when we we look at those types of things, I think we need a generation of leadership, whether that's our current leadership or anything like that, that stops buying kind of the hype that Eric's talking about and buys what's best for their business. That's when we really go into those types of level that, which again, we see businesses winning. You got to this executive role, um, Mr. CEO, for some reason. So don't just forget like everything you learned in the last, you know, 40 years of a career and throw it out the window because you think that you need to be the AI business of the future. That's a sentence, not at all a strategy. So I think as we go into 2026, I'm hopeful we're going to see less of that nonsense and more of like, how do we become servant leaders and making sure that these tools are making our experience better for our customers, which is both our internal employees and external buyers. Oh, you read my heart, uh, Kyler. Absolutely. So it's, it's, I think all of us are in, in sync with this one. So it's like the culture comes from, you know, basic awareness and education. So, and, uh, I can see you smiling, Liz. Would you, do you, would you like go for, go, go next? Absolutely. I, I have a lot to say about executive teams. And uh, at my company, we do, uh, we have a little slide shoot silo that goes into what we call as anthropology. Now, there is corporate anthropology, and that looks at ways where how the people within the whole of the organization behave. However, enterprise anthropology looks at, by and large, the federal government identifies corporations as a person who can act on behalf of its you know, constituents, its board panels, its shareholders, whomever, um, as a person. So they are people. Well, we certainly wouldn't want a person who's out there to make a you know, decision to fire or hire 800,000 people or you know however many people uh, at large. We would want answers from them on why. So I think having the accountability and a can-do executive panel is huge. Changing the culture around the psychology of who we have as leaders is also another conversation that we probably need to have because they're, that's where we get into bias in the machines and how these things are being coded and what they're allowed to get away with and all of the other things that come with humanity that we might not in AAC. And how do you cut the brakes on something that you don't even know that you're up, up again? Eric, probably I'll have a different flavor of the same question. So AI is not something new. It has been there for a very long period of time. And as you rightly high, you know, hinted, there is a lot of hype that has happened in the recent uh, recent past. And as a result of it, there is the overinvestment and everything else. How does that play into the culture of decision making in the organization, especially at the exec level? Yeah, I mean, the hype has always been a matter of anthropomorphization, which is a big problem in trying to put the word intelligent, ascribe the word intelligent, which is nothing if not both subjective and something very specific to humans. Ascribing that word to a machine, it qu very quickly becomes a problem. Um, the anthropomorphization just got a lot worse <laughs> three years ago because large language models are so uncanny. They're so seemingly human-like. And I think the difference between what they're capable of and what humans are capable of in general will become increasingly clear. Um, I, I think that the, um, the question of trust that you'd asked a moment ago is, is, is absolutely... Um, the right question, the most salient question, because most of these projects, an MIT report that came out in August shows uh, only 5% of the generative AI pilots actually get into production. Um, and that's because, as Kyler put it, you know, you've got this delusional thinking <laughs> from executives in the sense that, uh, th so there's this kind of uh, tug of war between the sort of ambition and hope and and wonderment which very quickly becomes believing too much about what the machine's capable of.
But then that, because that turns out to not be credible, because it does hallucinate and make other mistakes uh, or have demonstrate other kinds of problematic behavior, um, it can't get deployed. As I mentioned earlier, hybrid is the way to create reliability, to ensure reliability, do the number crunching. If there's a theme here about data governance and sort of tracking the right data, it's not just the data that feeds into a machine learning system or any kind of a tuning of an existing large language model, what have you. It's also the data that's tracking the performance of the would-be system that may hinge largely on generative AI, um, but data about its performance for the particular use case, not just these general aptitude tests that are meant to test humans, um, not those types of benchmarks that are so often covered in the press, but a, a benchmark, a, a, a measure of how well it performs at the task at hand and tracking that very concretely so you can make a feasibility study and or generate that predictive interception layer that's flagging cases that are most likely to be problematic where you can then judiciously target that more expensive human in the loop. Having said all that, again, if predictive is the other kind of LA, uh, the other kind of AI, the kind that's just not getting as much attention as it should, it has very much an analogous issue still, even after decades, it still hasn't quite reached the level of professionalization in general, because most of those projects also don't get off the ground. They don't launch, operationalize, deploy. Um, as, uh, you know, as Kyler said, an AI, AI system can flag anomalies. It doesn't, that doesn't dictate how the organizations, what the organization might do with those flags. So actually acting on them, operations don't improve unless they change, particularly by way of the output of predictive model. Actually acting on that's the operationalization. That's where you actually start to not only um, have generated potential value, but you're actually capturing that value, you're improving operations that way. So that's a little bit of a, it's very analogous. It's a little bit of a different story. Gen AI systems don't deploy because they're too ambitious, at least without a human judiciously in the loop to, to ensure reliability. They turn out to not be reliable enough. Predictive AI, on the other hand, the kinds of use cases that it's used for, for targeting, marketing, credit scoring, risk management, et cetera, those things are more tolerant to errors. We're just going to make less errors than if humans were doing it. We're predicting better than guessing. We don't have a magic crystal ball. So the, it is it, typically the number crunching, the core science, the machine learning model is good enough to be deployed, but the organization doesn't get it. They might get the basic idea, you know, um, if they're relatively advanced and they're and there's a project that has potential to get deployed, you might have decision makers to get the idea that, hey, um, I know it's not a magic crystal ball. It's it's kind of somehow predict better in guessing. And that's the best we can hope for, no matter how sophisticated the model is, because we don't we we don't have a prognostication machine that's magic, right? But what they don't get is how that translates into concrete business metrics like profit and savings, monetary performance, if we were to actually deploy this and systematically act on the model's predictions. Um, that's what we're doing at Gooder AI. So in the case of generative, we got we to gotta establish a feasible goal. In the case of predictive, we have, to tr we have to communicate that feasibility in terms of business needs. So there's two different kind of barriers, but they're very analogous in terms of this lack of deployment.